Hi, this is the second of three talks on TDA and statistics. I'm going to be talking about persistence landscapes. We're following the work of Peter Bubinick in his paper, Statistical Topological Data Analysis Using Persistence Landscapes, that appeared in the Journal of Machine Learning Research. It's a very readable article, so if you're interested in persistent landscapes, want to learn a little bit more of the details, I suggest that you look at his paper. So from part one of this series of three talks, we saw that without additional structure, there's an obstruction to defining uh, or to doing statistics on topological data. And the obstruction is that there is not a unique mean that is also a persistence diagram. So if we take two persistence diagrams, try to construct some an average or mean of them, and we write down one persistence diagram, it's possible there will be a second, which will satisfy the properties of a mean. And we saw an example of that. Okay, so now to overcome this problem, uh, we have to augment the idea of a persistence diagram. So in mathematical language, we want to map persistence diagrams into a space of real valued functions. The persistence diagrams map them to a space of real valued functions. There we can average functions, so there's a, well, there's a concept of mean, and it is well defined. Okay, so what we have to do is for each persistence diagram, x, We'll construct a finite con collection of what we call landscape functions. And this is, a, I'll break it down into a two step process. This isn't identical to what Bubinick does in his paper, but it's equivalent. First thing we want to do is switch from BD, so birth and death coordinates, to MH coordinates. So M is 1 half B plus D, so that's the midpoint of the life, you could say, or the persistence point. H is D minus B over 2, so that you could say is half of the life time. Okay? So notice the diagonal in this uh, uh, conversion of coordinates, D equals B, goes to H equals 0. So here's a simple example with three points, and we'll follow this through and see what we get. Okay. So we have three points on the left, three persistence points, 2, 4, 3, 9, and 7, 10. So we change coordinates. So BD goes to 1 half B plus D, and H, which equals D minus B over 2. And you see the three points on the left go to 3, 1, 6, 3, 8 and a half, 1 and a half. So that's the first step. The second step is we're going to construct what I'll call peak functions. So for each persistence point, we're going to have a peak. So we can think of landscapes and peaks, if we like, with mountain ranges. And you'll notice there's a scale change. So what we're going to do is construct for each persistence point on the modified persistence point on the right, we're going to construct a single function. That's our peak function. The It's non-zero everywhere except during the lifetime of the point. And during that lifetime, we get the geometry of it is it's a right triangle, hypotenuse on the diagonal, and it's an uh, isosceles right triangle. And how do we construct this? Well, let's take one of the points. Let's take this point 2, 4 on the right. That maps to the point 3, 1, sorry, 2, 4 on the left. That maps to 3, 1 on the right. And with these change of coordinates, you notice the hypotenuse of the triangle on the right, that equals 2. That's the lifetime of the point. So that's so this 2 equals 4 minus 2. So we see, we see a nice representation geometrically. We see the persistence point. We look at the hypotenuse, which is on the horizontal axis. What do we see? We see the lifetime there. Okay. Now we have three of them. I modified the other two in a similar way. So we get right triangles. Here's one with a peak at 6, 3. And if we look at the base, that's 6, uh, six 3 comes from 3, 9. The lifetime is 6. If we go to the point on the right, 7, 10, that mapped to 8 and a half, 1 and a half. The lifetime of the original point is 10 minus 7, so that's 3. So you see we get a nice geometric transformation. And notice the scale change, the triangles we drew on the left. For instance, the one on the lower left here, the hypotenuse is 2 radical 2, where here on the right, the hypotenuse was 2. Okay, now for each persistence point, we have a function, so I'll call that function h, that's equals fi of m, 
So here we see three functions, three peak functions, f1, f2, f3. So let's work this out in some detail so we can write a formula. f2 corresponded to the point bd, that was 3, 9. That has peak function, peak at m equals b plus d over 2, so that we get 6. So there's the peak with m value 6, and the height is d minus b over 2, that's 3. So we see this point in the diagram, 6, 3. Okay, now we want to define F2. We'd like to write a formula like you would in calculus. Okay, so here's the formula. Of course, it's piecewise defined because it's made up of linear functions on for different intervals on the m axis. So we have it's zero for m less than or equal to three. It equals m minus three, so that has slope one and intercept three between three and six. That's the left hand side of the triangle here. And then we have 9 minus m on the right-hand side. So between 6 and 9, the value m has, is, and m is the domain. We get 9 minus m, slope minus 1. We get this segment. And of course, if it's larger than m, we get 0. Now that's for the particular formula we had for this 0.63. Here's the general formula. I won't read it again. But you can see it's the same formula replacing the values 6 and 3 by B and M. Okay. Now these aren't the landscape functions yet. We're going to use these peak functions to define the landscape functions. And we're going to do it iteratively. So we'll define first what we'll call lambda 1, then lambda 2, and so on. So lambda 1 is defined as follows. So we have a point M on the horizontal axis, and we want to define the value of uh, lambda 1 at that point. So what we do is the following. We take all the landscape, all the peak functions we have at that time. So we have f1 of m, f2 of m, however many we have. In this diagram, we only have three. So we have a finite collection of values. We define lambda 1 at that point to be the maximum of the values. So if you like, if you think of this as literally a landscape with mountains, this is the profile of the mountains, the highest point. Okay. Now to get lambda 2, we're going to do something similar, except for lambda 2 of m, we'll do the same max function, except we remove the highest value. So whatever the highest value was, which we used to define lambda 1, we remove that from the collection, and we take the next highest value, and that becomes lambda 2. So in this case, uh, I've written the point that we remove is f j1 of m, and we'll call that value, that was the value lambda 1 m we had previously. Right? Now we repeat this process. Let's do it again. We'd say lambda 3. Well, what is that? It will be the third highest value. So that means we remove two values from our set. Say fj1 and fj2. fj1 is the point we removed after the first landscape function is defined. fj2 is the value that we use for the second landscape function. We remove those two, take the maximum. So this is the third largest value. Notice that some of these values can be the same. So for example, it could be that we have two landscape functions at a point which coincide. And, that, and if they were the largest, then we would remove one of them. We would still have one of them left. OK, so what does this do? This produces a, a finite sequence of functions, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, and so on. And because we're picking the largest value at each time, but we've removed the previous largest value, we know this is a decreasing sequence of functions. So it's called capital lambda. That is the landscape. It consists of a sequence of functions. Okay, And uh, we can extend this, if we like, to lambda i for i an element of n by adding zero functions. This will be useful because when we compare persistence diagrams, they may have different numbers of points. The landscapes may have different numbers of non-zero functions. So if we extend it by zero, then we can compare even if we don't have a non-zero function for one of the landscapes. Okay, so in this example, we had lambda i m equals zero for i greater than or equal to k. Here, lambda three is zero. Okay. So let's keep going. Let's return to that question of the mean of persistence diagrams. First of all, mean of functions. If we have two functions, real valued functions, we can define the mean point-wise. So f bar or f hat, f bar, I guess, of x, that's 1 half f1x plus f2x. 
The functions f are continuous and defined everywhere, so the mean is well defined. If we have two landscapes, so now lambda is a capital lambda is a collection of function landscape functions lambda i. Capital M here, or capital mu, is a collection of landscape functions mu i of m. All right? And so what do we do? The mean landscape is simply the average, one half lambda plus m, lambda plus capital mu. And what is it? It's one half lambda one plus mu one, lambda two plus mu two, and so on. All right, this is well defined. There's no ambiguity here. Right. Now let's do an example. Let's see what we get. So this will be a modified form of that original example that we used in the preceding uh, lecture. And we want to, we said, well, the Shea mean is not unique. Let's see what we get. Okay, so here's the picture. We now have two landscapes or two persistence diagrams in the upper left. A diagram P and a diagram Q. So P is in red, Q is in blue. And I've also put in here in yellow and green the two possible mean diagrams which we used to show that the uh, Fouché mean is not well defined. Okay. Well, if we transform these, uh, I'll transform all eight of those points to the right. You see the square becomes uh, a uh, diamond. It's rotated. Uh, Okay, so that's the transform persistence points. We have uh, landscape diagram, we have landscape functions for both P and Q. So here they are on the left, we have MQ and lambda P. You notice on the left, they overlap because if you look at the blue points on the upper left-hand side on the diagram, if you were to extend those triangles, we would see they, uh, they do overlap. And uh, you can see that the death time of the first point on the left is larger than the birth time of the second. So that means when we go to the landscapes down here, we get an overlap. The death time of the first is greater than or equal to the death time, the birth time of the second. On the other hand, if we look at the red points, so we have the red points, the triangles there do not overlap because the first, the second of the two points, its birth time is after the birth time of the larger of the points, and its death time is less than the death time at the larger of the two points. So you see here, we get uh, one landscape function lambda one. You could say it entirely contains it. If I were speaking more uh, formally, I would say the support, that's the place where functions are non-zero, the closure of it. The support of lambda one strictly contains the support of lambda two. So let's go on. We have the landscapes. We still have to compute the averages. So here I've repeated, we have lambda p, uh, and then capital mu q is here uh, on the left. And we want to take the averages. So what I've done on the right, this is this is going to be the average for the first landscapes. And this is the average function. This is for the second landscape function here. So for the first one, we're averaging the lambda 1 function in red and the mu 1 function in yellow. So we put them together, so that's on the upper right, and here you see the average is that function in black. Since they coincide, this is easy to see. The average is just the average, uh, gives us a trapezoid here, between the peak of one and the valley of the other. Right? On the other hand, for lambda two and mu two, they, they are the same. So what we see is lambda, uh, the average is one half lambda two plus mu two, and we see it here. All three of those functions coincide. We put them together, and the average landscape is on the right. So here we have one half uh, lambda one plus mu one, and one half lambda two plus mu two. This is the average. So this is a well-defined, a unique average of functions. Now, on the other hand, if you said, well, does that correspond to a persistence diagram? You can see that it doesn't. This is not the landscape of a persistence diagram. So the space of landscape functions is much larger than the space of the landscape functions produced by persistence diagrams. Okay. In any case, let me show you an example from Bubenik's paper. Uh, this is an important example to think about, both because it's demonstrating landscape functions, but also it's saying something about how topologists think about persistence and how to test what's going on with persistence. It's useful to think about two Prime, two prime examples, a torus, 
So that's a two, again, this is a two dimensional surface, not solid, and a sphere. Again, it's two dimensional. We choose these because the homology of those are simple, but they are distinct. They both have uh, dimension. The first betting number is the zeroth betting number is one for both, but the first betting number for a torus is two. There are two essential cycles that around this torus. The first betting number for the sphere is zero. There are no essential cycles. On the other hand, in dimension two, uh, we have one cycle on the left, one cycle on the right. The entire torus consists of a cycle. The entire sphere consists of a cycle. All right, so we, it's, the homology is well understood for a very long time. But now what we want to do is look at it from a persistence point of view. So what we're going to do is sample the points. So this is from Bubenik. He samples the torus and the sphere, so choosing 100 sample points on each, 1,000 sample points on each. He does this 100 times and then takes the mean over 100 samples. So he's going to compute landscape functions for a large number of points, 1,000 points. He's going to do it 100 times, and then he's going to average them. So in some sense, this should be a robust representation of the homology uh, persistent homology of these two uh, sets. Okay, and he does it in dimension zero, one, and two. Uh, so here we have we have on the right we have the filtered complexes. So remember, if we, we sample, we're going to build a complex on top of that. Say we use the rips construction, so we're using putting balls around the points and including edges if the two balls overlap. We get a complex. Here we see the complexes he's getting. Three examples of it. Uh, from those complexes, you can produce uh, persistence diagrams. From those persistence diagrams, you can produce landscapes. And here we see landscapes in for the torus. We see landscape in dimension zero, dimension one, dimension two. Similarly, for the sphere. Okay. Well, I just said that we know the homology of the sphere and the torus. We know their Betty numbers. So in dimension zero, what do we expect to see? For large values of the persistence parameter, we're going to see a single connected component in dimension zero, similar for the torus and for the sphere. And we see that. We see a single large peak in both cases. That's representing the long-lived cycle. It lives essentially for infinity. So we see this long cycle. And the hypotenuse of that cycle is the entire uh, M axis. Okay. Now you notice this the way this is set up. Bubinik has shown us both dimension uh, has shown this, and we see different cycles appearing. It's layered. So this is the first this persistent, sorry, first persistence landscape function here at the top. What's this other one? There are other persistence landscape functions, a second, a third, and a fourth, because we have other persistence points. He's taken a very large number of them and averaged them. So if you take a large number of these and average them, you expect to get essentially a, we'll get a continuous function, but it will smooth out. And this appears to be smooth. It's not actually, but it appears that way. Now, if we go to dimension one for the torus, we see two primary peaks here. Looks like there are two of them. So that would be our two cycles the torus because this second betting number of the torus, first betting number of the torus is two. Now we go to dimension two. We see again one large landscape function that would be the lambda one. The others are smaller. So again, that's the one cycle in dimension two for a torus. The single the single cycle, which is the entire torus. We do the same thing for the sphere. The sphere is similar in dimension zero, but in dimension one here we see a single peak. And that peak isn't very strong, so that means eventually it's going to disappear when in persistence as the persistence parameter increases. And finally, we have dimension two, which resembles that of the torus, except we don't see this behavior uh, down on the right that we see on the torus. We don't see that in the sphere. So we're not seeing these second, third, and fourth landscape functions persisting. Right. So that's this example. Remember, when you're thinking about testing different ideas about homology. It's useful to have some good sampled spaces to work on. A sphere and a torus are common ones. And that's the end of this presentation. Thank you.